security part of the topic. And of course, you had an expert lecture yesterday from Professor Ali that hopefully gave some of the foundational concepts of how cybersecurity works, how states and non-state actors carry out and prosecute cyber conflicts. And if there are any sort of lingering questions from that lecture yesterday, I can do my best to answer them. I'm, of course, not as qualified on this subject as Professor Ali is, but um, I can, you know, I'll do my best. So um, the plan for the lecture today, uh, the first thing I want to do is give a little bit more specific background on NATO cybersecurity operations in particular, as opposed to the kind of general overview from yesterday. I want to talk about some of the topicality arguments um, in a little bit more detail than, uh, than Kevin was able to do in the topic lecture with regard to cybersecurity. And then I want to talk a bit more in depth about what I think some of the likely affirmative ground on the cybersecurity part of the topic will be. And finally, the negative ground on the cybersecurity topic. Um, I should have, hopefully, if, if I can cover, which is never my strong suit, but if I can cover, we should have some decent uh, time for questions at the end as well. So first thing I want to talk about by way of background is a timeline of some of the major actions that NATO has taken alliance-wide with regard to cybersecurity. And most of these events come in the form of summit communiques. So NATO typically has a summit every year in a different location in a NATO country. And those summits kind of come to be known as you know, the Brussels summit, the Chicago summit, et cetera. They're named for um, the place in which they occurred. So in 2002, in the Prague summit, was NATO's first official acknowledgment of cybersecurity as a relevant dimension of security and potential conflict that the alliance would uh, need to be aware of and um, accountable for. So the document, the, the communique from the Prague summit cited the need to strengthen capabilities and defend against cyber attacks. And one of the things to know about NATO, like many international organizations, is that it moves fairly slowly. That you know, NATO takes a while to kind of get its, uh, get its head around new security ideas. And so the first time an, an, an issue like cybersecurity is acknowledged in a NATO communique, um, they're not going to you know, develop very detailed policy or doctrine on that issue the first time an issue comes up. It's sort of more of a, an acknowledgement of the need to be aware of an issue, to monitor its evolution, to study it, and to develop potential NATO responses. So there's not much significant new action on cybersecurity for the next several years. But in 2007, um, Estonia was the victim of what are pretty confidently attributed to be Russian cyber attacks. And um, the triggering event for this was something about uh, Estonia moving some monuments to Soviet soldiers, it's like a purely cultural thing that prompted um, some quasi-governmental and non-governmental Russian hacking groups to launch a large-scale DDoS, or distributed denial of service attack, against the websites of a lot of uh, public services and institutions in Estonia. So banks, government websites, um, hospital websites, things like that. It was you know, purely, uh, purely data-based. There were no physical or kinetic effects of these cyber attacks. But um, they did basically grind public life in Estonia to a halt for a while. Um, and so this was kind of a significant wake-up call for NATO. This was the first tangible illustration of the effect that cyber attacks could have on, um, you know, on, on public life and, and on national security. And so this event, probably more than anything else in the mid-2000s, prompted NATO to really kind of evolve its cybersecurity doctrine and take cybersecurity seriously. So um, in 2008, at the Bucharest summit, uh, two deliverables come out of that summit. Two tangible organizations or structures essentially are added to NATO. Um, the first is the Cyber Defense Management Authority, which is 
um, essentially a, a NATO governing structure that tries to unify the cybersecurity practices and policies of NATO as a whole. Now, another thing about NATO um, that I'm sure you all know is that typically on a day-to-day -day basis, there are not that many forces, like actual military forces that wear the NATO hat. Right? NATO is a conglomeration of national militaries. They often act in concert. You know, there were, in the first lecture yesterday, there was a list of some significant NATO operations, the Balkans in the 90s, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera. Those missions occasionally do have troops under NATO command, but that is the exception rather than the rule. And it's sort of the same thing with, with regard to cybersecurity. NATO has networks and systems that are official NATO networks that need to remain secure, but also each of its member states have their own national military relevant computer networks that need to be secured. So um, the CDMA's mandate is primarily to secure the networks of NATO itself, but also to provide kind of a forum um, and leadership for best practices and policies that, that individual member states can implement to bolster their own cybersecurity. The second thing that comes out of the Bucharest Summit is the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. And I just noticed a typo in that name because the European center, spelling of center is C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, um, but you will see the C in defense as well. So European spellings tripped me up on that one. But the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence is essentially a think tank that NATO facilitates and operates, that it does things like hold conferences, trainings, workshops, et cetera, that bring together um, not just the, the military forces and, and military cyber experts of member states, but also significantly uh, members of the private sector, academia, et cetera. Um, and we'll talk uh, in a moment about one of the most significant early deliverables from the CCDCOE, which was uh, a, a publication called the Talon Manual, um, which was very important in the, in the development of international law surrounding cyberspace. So the CCDCOE produces publications, documents, training, et cetera. It's, it's a knowledge center for cybersecurity in NATO. In 2012, at the Chicago summit, the Alliance affirms the goal of bringing all of NATO's networks under centralized protection. So this is four years after the CDMA is established. And like I said, NATO kind of moves slowly with, these, uh, with regard to these policies. It takes a while to get institutions off the ground and running. So at 2012, or in 2012, the Alliance doesn't even accomplish the goal of bringing all of its networks under centralized protection. It just kind of reaffirms its commitment to do that as an ongoing thing. Probably the most relevant parts of this timeline for the debates that we will actually have begin in 2014 with the Wales Summit. So in 2014, NATO declares that international law applies in cyberspace. And this is significant because international law governs the, both the conditions under which states can resort to the use of military force, but also the conduct that states uh, must abide by when conducting military operations. And in a moment, we'll talk about international law of the use of force and how that relies to cyber, or relates to cybersecurity. Um, but it's a significant development that NATO declares its belief that international law applies in cyberspace. And as a corollary to that, um, NATO declares at this summit that cyber defense is part of NATO's operational mandate. That, so essentially what that means is that if the Alliance declares a cyber attack as an armed attack requiring joint response, that would be an invocation of Article 5, right? So if something is part of NATO's operational mandate, that means that its collective defense pact could be activated in response to that threat. So um, this is something important to kind of to keep in mind as well. Um, and so if you're producing evidence in the cybersecurity area for an AF or a case neg, et cetera, it's kind of important to keep an eye on the date of that evidence. So again, NATO policies in these issues begin fairly vague in general. 
right? Once a, a policy is enunciated, there's not much guidance or clarification on exactly what type of cyber attack will trigger Article 5, that kind of thing. That's just the nature of how NATO works. So if you see evidence from 2014, 2015, 2016 that is describing the ambiguity or the lack of clarity surrounding NATO's cyber policy, that's kind of a natural outgrowth of the fact that it's a new declaration that has not been given a lot of debate or discussion by NATO yet, but in the intervening years, by now, almost 10 years later, after the Wales Summit, there's been a lot more debate and discussion about NATO's cyber policy, and it's become a bit clearer, although, um, as we'll see in a moment, it still leaves significant strategic ambiguity. In 2016, at the Warsaw Summit, NATO declares cyberspace to be the fourth operational domain. And that's significant because, so before this, the operational domains in, uh, you know, in which um, NATO operated were land, sea, and air, right? The classic kind of domains of military operations, armies, navies, air forces, right? Those are the three, prior to this, the three domains in which NATO organizes and operates forces. Um, recently, in I think 2019, NATO declared a fifth operational domain. Does anyone know what that is? Anyone got a guess? Space, yes, outer space is the fifth operational domain for NATO, but so in 2016, cyberspace becomes the fourth operational domain. Also at that summit, NATO signs a cyber defense pledge for na nations to secure their networks and for NATO to monitor their progress and provide them best practices. So again, as we saw from, you know, back in 2008, the creation of the CDMA happens eight years ago, and at this point we're still kind of signing declarations and pledges of our intent to, uh, to secure all of our networks collectively, um, which is an ongoing process. In 2020, NATO publishes the Allied Joint Doctrine for Cyberspace Operations. So there's an important distinction to, to be aware of between policy and doctrine. Um, not just in NATO, but in, in any military structure. Policy sets out the broad parameters of what is allowed for a military alliance or a military organization to do, but it does not detail exactly how that policy will be carried out, right? It doesn't um, detail how operations will be conducted, what the rules of engagement are, things like that. That is for doctrine. And so the actual joint doctrine for the alliance is a classified document, um, but NATO and, and other military organizations do often publish public versions of things like doctrine to give um, publics in their own member states as well as adversaries a kind of idea of how the alliance intends to conduct operations in cyberspace. In 2021, the alliance reaffirms that Article 5 can be triggered by certain cyber attacks and every time there's a NATO summit that kind of reaffirms the applicability of Article 5 to a cyber attack, uh, what you'll see happen in the press is there will be a lot of kind of breathless articles get published right after that summit that treat the declaration of Article 5 applying to something as kind of a new um, escalatory big deal idea. It's kind of not. We've known for a while at this point that the Alliance considers cyber attacks to be capable of triggering Article 5. Um, and so this is not really new information at this point. Um, at the 2021 Brussels summit, NATO again clarifies that decisions to invoke Article 5 in response to cyber attacks would be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, that is not really different from any other type of armed attack that could trigger Article 5. An important thing to know about how NATO works is that Article 5 is depicted as automatic, you know, and in a sense it is, but it's not exactly. All of the members of the alliance have to agree that something constitutes an armed attack in order to invoke Article 5. Now, of course, there are some armed attacks that are completely unambiguous, right? As the first lecture yesterday s stated, if Russia were to launch a missile against Poland, obviously that would be an armed attack, and any ally that tried to filibuster or forestall invoking Article 5 against that attack would be um, an absolute pariah. But 
for example, the, the only time that Article 5 has ever been invoked in practice after September 11th, right, that was not a traditional armed attack in the sense in which we're used to it, right? It was not a state using military force against another state. It was a non-state actor conducting terrorism. And yet, the alliance all unanimously agreed that it was of sufficient gravity to justify the invocation of Article 5. Cyber attacks are pretty similar. One thing that the Alliance has suggested is that attacks of the sort that, uh, that Estonia suffered in 2007 would likely be candidates for Article 5 invocation today. Another important thing to keep in mind about Article 5 is that its invocation, as was stated in the lecture yesterday, does not necessarily require any given particular response, right? It's not as though Article 5 gets invoked and then it's full-scale US-Russia nuke war the next day, right? Article 5 just obligates the members to take collective defense measures as they deem necessary. And so if a cyber attack were to invoke Article 5, um, one of the things that could be done in response could be um, hackbacks or cyber retaliation or economic sanctions against the offending party, things like that, right? Article 5 is not an automatic tripwire for full-scale war. It is simply um, an invocation of a requirement that all the allies do what they've pledged to do, which is to act collectively to meet the threat. So the last part of the timeline recently this year um, was the first meeting of senior cyber coordinators from all NATO members. So each NATO member has designated a uh, senior cyber coordinator to liaison with NATO and um, discuss the implementation of NATO policies with regard to cybersecurity. I couldn't find who our senior cyber coordinator for NATO is. I could not find that information. If any of you can, you're a better researcher than me. But that person is, you know, kind of covert at this point. And the agenda for this meeting was essentially to discuss the cybersecurity environment post-Ukraine conflict, um, as uh, Professor Ali discussed yesterday. So I think this is a really good summary piece of evidence about a lot of the things that I was saying about Article 5. Um, I'll read some, you know, some lines. So uh, starting kind of midway through, no cyber incident thus far led to Article 5. Neither has the Alliance stated what damage the attack would have to cause. This is sometimes criticized for being vague. It is logical. The extent of an attack and allied response must remain vague. The Alliance does not provide adversaries the threshold between everyday attack and armed attack. Uncertainty serves as a deterrent and can motivate an adversary to exercise restraint and avoid large-scale attack. NATO does not want to weaken its position by revealing its red lines. Attacks similar to Estonia could lead to Article 5 invocation today. Cyber activities can be met with proportional responses. States can coordinate economic or diplomatic measures without Article 5. This developed as a natural response to evolution of the threat landscape, not a novelty of Ukraine. So this kind of touches on a lot of the points I was making before, which is that NATO's response to things like cyber insecurity evolve. They're not static, and there is a logic to the vagueness of what attacks will trigger Article 5. If NATO were to declare extremely explicit red lines, like for example, some people have proposed a, uh, a, a criteria for, um, for cyber attacks triggering Article 5 that they cause the loss of life or damage to property. If those criteria were the only things that the Alliance would say uh, could cause the invocation of Article 5 in response to a cyber attack, then adversaries, particularly Russia, but also other adversaries, would know that they can essentially conduct attacks below that threshold, right? For example, the DDoS type of attacks that were launched against Estonia, deleting financial information, et cetera. As long as they don't directly lead to the loss of life or damage to property, um, those attacks would be essentially guaranteed to not trigger a collective alliance response. And so the argument for strategic ambiguity with regard to the criteria for invoking Article 5 is that um, you want to introduce uncertainty in the mind of the adversary, which induces restraint. Some words on cybersecurity and international law. The relevant parts of international law to understand for uh, this area of debate 
is what's called International Humanitarian Law, or IHL. And the particularly relevant parts of IHL um, for us to know about are what's called the Jus Ad Bellum, it's Latin, the J is like a Y, and the Jus In Bello. So those are two branches of international law. The Jus Ad Bellum is the law of resort to force. What that means is it's the law that governs when states can legally use armed force. The use in bello is the law of what states can do once an armed conflict has begun. So there are six criteria for the use ad bellum. They deal with things like, was the attack provoked? Is there a reasonable chance of success? Are the means of, of carrying out the conflict proportional to the ends? Things like that, right? Is the war justified? The use in bello has three primary criteria. Those are proportionality, which means that force that you use in a conflict must be proportional to the end that you are gaining, right? You cannot uh, essentially use more force than is necessary. Necessity, which is the idea that force is necessary to achieve your ends, right? There is no less damaging way to achieve your ends, like economic sanctions, diplomacy, et cetera. And the third principle of the use in bello is distinction. You must distinguish between military targets and civilian targets. So this is why, one reason, as a side note, why the war on terror is so difficult to conduct is because one of the main things that separates organized state militaries from insurgents and terrorist groups is that insurgents and terrorist groups typically do not distinguish themselves from civilians by doing things like wearing military uniforms, declaring themselves, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the entire legal black hole of the war on terror is, is contained within that idea of distinction. And that can also be a problem in prosecuting cyber conflict, right? Um, does a cyber attack that takes out a country's power grid necessarily violate the principle of distinction by you know, disabling military targets from using that power grid, but also by compromising the ability of civilians to rely on the power grid for services that they need. So those issues are kind of you know, the core of international law with regard to armed conflict. And there are a variety of ways that cyber attacks and cyber retaliation can implicate the principles. Another important thing to keep in mind is the distinction between customary international law and treaty law. So customary international law is something that you've probably encountered in debate. Um, it's been uh, an impact of various things, a process counter plan recently. And what customary international law is, is the basic way to think about it is it's international law that is not written down. It's international law that comes from the overall gradual evolution of state practice that is combined with statements about how states interpret their obligations under the general corpus of international law. So if a state does something repeatedly and, and, and interprets that publicly as what it believes to be an international obligation, even if it hasn't signed a treaty to that effect, it can form customary international law. So one of the ways in which this manifests tangibly is the United States has not ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but we do follow most of its principles, if not all, and we do interpret them as customary international law obligations. Even though you know, we will not be bound by them by our signature on a treaty, we interpret them as customary obligations. So for international law, almost everything hinges on the existence of an armed attack. The existence of an armed attack is what justifies military force in response, and defining an armed attack with regard to cyberspace is notoriously difficult. There is not an official ratified international agreement that defines what an armed attack is, even for conventional military force, let alone cyber conflicts. So states interpret armed attack through the process of justifying conflicts, 
of justifying responses to conflicts, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that the United States said to justify the war on terrorism was that 9-11 was an armed attack. And that gets tricky because typically in international law, the only actors that are capable of conducting an armed attack are states. So what happens when a non-state group conducts an armed attack? It's difficult, right? These are thorny issues in international law that do not have settled definitive answers. So one of the ways that NATO has contributed to the development of international law with regard to cyberspace is through the Talon Manual and the Talon Manual 2.0. So this was the document that I referenced earlier that was produced by the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of, Ec Ec or, yeah, the, CC C the CCDCOE. It is an authoritative yet unofficial interpretation of how international law applies to cyberspace. So when I say authoritative yet unofficial, what I mean is the authors were primarily academics and uh, citizens acting in their individual capacities rather than the official representatives of states. It is not a binding document, right? It is uh, just a book that was published by a group of cybersecurity experts that articulated some of the principles that they believed um, could you know, shape the, the evolution of norms with regard to uh, cyberspace and international law, primarily dealing with the criteria that would have to be met for a cyber attack to constitute an armed attack. So the next big chunk to discuss is topicality arguments for the cybersecurity area. The first thing, and, and I think the most useful at the very beginning of the season, will be what Kevin referred to in the topic lecture as the CIA triad argument. Um, the idea that cybersecurity is about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information, systems, and networks. Another question that I think is actually pretty definitively AF, but is worth asking is, does cybersecurity include offensive operations? And the last question where I think there's a bit more debate is, does cybersecurity include information warfare? So we're gonna look at a couple of cards. We'll try to do it quickly. So this is a, a shorter highlighted version of a part of the COSIF article that forms the, the CIA violation that's in the topicality file in the starter set. So the reason that I think this interpretation is potentially viable, even if it's not you know, explicitly intent to define and exclude, is that it does suggest that cybersecurity should be treated holistically, right? It should be treated as not simply securing data itself, not simply securing physical networks, but the holistic securing and protection of the entire system that facilitates the exchange of data and information. And so I, the, the parts that I highlighted in this card, um, you know, say things like in the second paragraph, cybersecurity is conflated with data security. It is only one part. Cybersecurity focuses not only on protection of data, but also systems and networks. Cybersecurity involves more than protection of data. Lines like that I think are okay at excluding an affirmative that would only, for example, deal with data security. Um, so I think that, and I, I believe this is done in the starter set as well, uh, this is one of those violations where you might wanna pair it with an interpretation like substantially is in the main, in the area means all activities in the area, that card from the Law of the Sea Treaty that, Bricker, shout out, Kansas, great argument. I'm not, I'm not kidding, that argument's good. Um, what are some affirmatives this interpretation could exclude? One idea that I had was that it could exclude the information warfare affirmative. Arguably, the information warfare affirmative would only secure the integrity of information rather than uh, systems or networks, depending on what the plan would do. Afs like a cybersecurity AF that would only secure undersea cables might only secure systems, and I guess the question is, does securing a physical computer system necessarily also secure the data on that system? That's what I would say if I was AF, but there's a debate that AFs that target one specific system of cybersecurity um, do not 
do the holistic protection of data systems and networks. Same thing with an app that might target satellites. You could argue that that only secures a system, not the data on it. The question of whether cybersecurity includes offensive operations, I struck out cutting good neg cards for this interpretation. Based on what I read, I think that the consensus is pretty clear that cybersecurity can include offensive operations. I, if I were reading the cyber app that's in the starter packet, I would not be worried about losing to an argument that said cybersecurity was purely defensive. I think this card is pretty definitive. Cybersecurity is distinctive in its inclusion of offensive use of IT to attack adversaries. Does not get much more clear than that. So I was hoping to have more of a controversy to report to you uh, on this argument, but it seems pretty apt. A topicality argument that might have a little bit more controversy is whether information warfare is a topical cybersecurity affirmative. So um, this card suggests, and this is the same article as the last card, um, cybersecurity is not cyber warfare, which there are ununderlined parts of this card that make clear that cyber warfare is also not offensive cyber operations, which are cybersecurity. Don't worry about that. Uh, cybersecurity is not cyber warfare. Consensus is cyber warfare refers to the use of cybersecurity capabilities in a warfare context. This should not be confused with information warfare. It's worded a little ambiguously, but I think it suggests that information warfare is not necessarily part of cybersecurity. There are some decent affirmative pieces of evidence on this controversy, though. Um, I think this one is pretty definitive that um, information warfare is part of cybersecurity. And this card also suggests that, uh, that so the last line, fail failures didn't just compromise integrity of info, they also enabled the campaign to become incredibly more effective, but it uses that language of the integrity of information, right? From the CIA triad argument, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, so it uses that language that uh, information warfare compromised the integrity of information. Yeah, question. Uh, what do you mean by information warfare? I'm about to talk about that. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about what information warfare is in a moment um, when I get to the background part. I think this is the last topicality uh, controversy that I really saw for cybersecurity. Um, I didn't really delve into some of the other interpretations like the property rights one um, in the T file. That seems reasonable. Um, these were kind of the ones where I thought a bit of controversy might exist. So some affirmative ground ideas in the cybersecurity part of the topic. The first big one, and the one um, that is in our evidence set as of now, deals with offensive cyber operations. And I think there are a lot of ways that affirmatives could craft ground in this area, either by expanding the use of OCOs or, or clarifying the, the principles for them within NATO, as, as our affirmative does, or um, potentially even restraining them. Um, you remember the topic lecture talked about the, the bi-directionality of the topic. This is something that um, could come up in cybersecurity. So current US cyber strategy is characterized by the government as persistent engagement, um, also known as defend forward. So persistent engagement is the idea that in order to achieve cybersecurity, the United States needs to be conducting continuous operations in the networks of our adversaries in order to understand the offensive tools that they possess and potentially to preempt them from being used. So under a persistent engagement strategy, we are continually probing the networks of our adversaries like China, Russia, et cetera. We are just kind of like trying to always be in their networks to know when an attack might be launched, to know what exploits they have, to know what vulnerabilities they have in case we need to attack them, et cetera. This strategy was adopted in 2019, and it caused a fair bit of controversy because you know, anytime the United States adopts a seemingly preemptive, escalatory, offensive military doctrine, it's reasonable grounds for controversy and concern, um, not just among our adversaries, but among allies as well. One thing that persistent engagement requires is the occasional entrance of US cyber operations into our allies' networks as well. 
Um, if you know, we're trying to understand a Russian exploit that might be targeting uh, energy infrastructure in Europe or something like that, then occasionally the US will enter our allies' networks and not always with permission. There has been a lot of friction between the US and allies about the procedures for um, our operations that kind of pass through an allies' network in order to understand or block a Russian um, exploit or attempt at malware. And so this is something that uh, comes up a lot in the 1AC of our cyber app, right? That offensive operations can introduce friction between the US and allies if we do not have a kind of agreed upon framework for, uh, for how those, those offensive operations are conducted, right? Um, and so the plan for that affirmative, I think, um, as, as I understand it, would essentially create common understandings for the protocols that we adopt um, in order to carry out offensive operations in concert with our allies. Yeah. So the, the question was, when the US enters adversaries' networks um, and gathers information and data about their capabilities, does that get fed back into the CCD COE? Probably not. Um, I, I think that, so that part of NATO is much more kind of just like, you know, private sector, open, educational. It's not the kind of like locked down, classified military operations center. Probably more the CDMA would be where that information would be routed through. As I was just kind of saying, allies bristle against disruptive operations in their networks, and the AF will attempt to kind of resolve the disagreements over OCO doctrine. So kind of set all that stuff without advancing the slide. Some other AFs, information warfare is a good example. Russia has conducted extensive influence operations against Western targets. And this is something that Professor Ali talked about a decent bit yesterday. So um, Russia was very active in the run-up to the US election in 2016. They accessed the actual networks connected to voting machines in a number of states. They did not conduct any operations that we verified, right? No vote totals were changed, things like that. But Russia did penetrate those networks. Um, more significantly, however, we believe that Russia was involved in things like spreading disinformation and, um, you know, and dissension essentially through social media and then kind of, you know, filtered that through social media into traditional media into the real world. Um, on the next slide, I'll kind of give an example of how this works. Um, but so the point is that uh, Russia uses disinformation operations as a tool to influence societies that it deems as adversaries. The goal is to kind of just sow chaos, to create polarization, disagreement, and reduce the functionality of governments in states that it perceives to be adversaries. Kind of did the same thing in the Brexit vote. Um, a lot of people believe that that was tar the target of Russian influence operations, as well as French elections in which far right candidates have run recently, and I believe the far right just made some gains in French parliamentary elections, um, but I don't think that uh, any of the, I think that most of Russia's influence operations in French elections have essentially ceased. I haven't heard reports of um, recent Russian influence ops in French elections, but I could be wrong. NATO kind of lacks unity on exactly what the nature of the threat from Russian influence operations is. Um, there's, you know, there are certain NATO members that are more threatened by Russian influence operations. Um, a, a member like Turkey might be hesitant to uh, take joint action against Russia for fear of reprisal, not wanting to compromise that relationship. So uh, there's kind of just debate and disagreement with regard to how NATO should operate in response to influence operations. And the information warfare affirmative, if the US can prompt some more unity or consensus around information warfare strategy for NATO, does access a decent advantage set. Um, it is something that could potentially access 
US-Russia conflict, um, and also an interesting set of advantages about things like the corruption of the information ecosystem and polarization, uh, the effectiveness of democratic governments, et cetera. So here's a really interesting example of how disinformation works. In the run-up to the 2020 election, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the United States, the agency that's responsible for election security, wanted to come up with a way that they could train local election officials to recognize and counter disinformation in their elections. And they didn't want to give training or information about explicitly political concepts, right? Because if it's too political, then uh, local officials in red states and blue states will disagree, the message won't get received, it won't be implemented effectively. So the task was come up with an issue that can illustrate disinformation that is completely apolitical. And what they settled on was the war on pineapple. The issue being, do you like pineapple on pizza or not? And there's a five-step process that uh, will show how disinformation works with regard to the highly partisan polarizing issue of pineapple on pizza. The first step is finding a divisive issue, right? And that's pretty easy in a society with a two-party system and an election that is very polarized, right? Um, the idea is not to actually win an argument. The idea is to just create division and disagreement and chaos. So you find the issue being, um, for example, the Democratic Party is split after the 2016 primary where the left wing of the party uh, backed Sanders and traditional centrist Democrats backed Clinton. So there's a polarized issue among Democrats and creating chaos among Democrats could uh, spill over to largely destabilize the presidential election, et cetera. Similar to choosing the issue of pineapple on pizza. Second, the disinformation operation moves social media accounts into place. And so as this slide suggests, sophisticated information operations often utilize old social media accounts that get scrubbed, remade, and you know, kind of being oriented around new issues because cultivating followings is difficult, right? If your disinformation campaign is a bunch of Twitter eggs with four followers, it's not going to be as effective as if it has established accounts that people engage with and know. So um, the second step of the operation is kind of coordinating the accounts that are going to carry out your operation. Third is amplifying and distorting the conversation. So basically inserting your very kind of hot take polarized perspective onto the social issue through social media, right? And you know, I think all of us are familiar with the feeling of seeing something on our Twitter timeline that kind of gets your blood boiling. You want to quote tweet it and flame it, et cetera. This is exactly the process that disinformation operations prey upon. They want you to take the bait, right? Um, anyone who kind of amplifies, responds to that message with an outraged message of their own is doing the work of disinformation. And the way that media works in the United States is through basically laundering things, controversies from social media onto, you know, kind of not exactly traditional media sources. This is how you get Snapchat news stories that are completely ridiculous, right, that you would never see on like the homepage of the New York, New York Times or something like that. You see things on TikTok, Instagram reels, et cetera. And then once those social media controversies become salient enough, the mainstream media will report on the existence of the controversy itself, right? The existence of that controversy becomes newsworthy. And then your disinformation campaign has largely succeeded because once the traditional wide audience mainstream media is reporting on something, then the large majority of the US population will encounter it, right? Then everyone will kind of know that there's a controversy about whether you like pineapple on pizza or not, that this is something that Americans define themselves by. It gets, you know, 
polarized. It becomes a tribal identity thing where we hate people who put pineapple on pizza. It's un-American. It's disgusting. It must be rooted out, et cetera, right? That is the ultimate endpoint of a disinformation campaign, is to create divisions on highly salient public issues that can prevent a society from governing itself effectively. And at the high end, disinformation campaigns spill into the real world, right? Um, a Facebook page will organize the rally against pineapple, and people will actually show up in the real world to a campaign that was started for the explicit purpose of creating dissension and disagreement in a society that the originator of the disinformation campaign believes is its enemy. That is how disinformation works. Other affirmative ground in the cybersecurity area, there are a lot of apps, I think, that will secure particular systems or networks. We talked about some of these already. There's an undersea cables affirmative that will target cybersecurity for the cables that provide um, connectivity to the internet and electronic commerce between uh, continents. There will be affirmatives that secure satellites and space-based assets from cyber attack. There will probably be affirmatives that secure specific military systems, missile defense, maybe aircraft carriers, maybe nuclear weapons. I haven't explicitly cut solvency evidence for these other kind of random ones, um, but I've seen solvency evidence definitely for the first two. And I imagine that someone will read affirmatives as the year goes on that target more and more specific uh, military systems for cybersecurity, mostly because being neck against those affirmatives is kind of difficult, right? The narrow AF that secures a critical military system against cyber attack can have an advantage. There might not be m many things that link to it, et cetera. So I think this will be an attractive uh, avenue for new affirmatives. One likely actor for affirmatives or one actor that, that an affirmative could defend is the Institute for Security Governance which is part of the Defense Security Cooperation University and the International School of Education and Advising, which is all wrapped up in the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, which is all wrapped up in the DOD. You can email them. On their website, they say that an expert will respond to all questions at that email address. So, if they, don't all do it at once, but I did want to include this because they were very clear that an expert will respond to your email if you have any questions about what they do. I'll send the slides out later so you can get that email address. You don't have to write it down right now. Some quick thoughts on debating cyber escalation, which will be one of the most prominent affirmative advantage areas in this part of the topic. Some arguments for why cyber attacks do cause escalation. The first is that a large scale cyber attack would have kinetic effects in the real world. For example, taking down the power grid, attacking critical infrastructure, etc. So, the reason why this could cause escalation of a conflict is because once operations start to have kinetic effects in the actual physical world, people start getting hurt, their interests are affected at the high end, people lose their lives. That would create a large political and public demand for retaliation of some sort. And states do not want to, especially democratic states, do not want to appear weak to their publics. The pressure for retaliation and retribution could be high and even without escalation, you know, we all kind of know that the grid is an impact that can be uh, fairly big on its own. So this is the most kind of basic um, argument for why a cyber attack could have a tangible effect or an impact or cause escalation to military force. Secondly, military systems could be compromised or spoofed. So C3 is the military term for command, control, and communication. These systems are highly reliant on satellites. The military is highly reliant on satellites for talking to forces in the field, for communications, for intelligence, for 
understanding where our adversary forces are, et cetera. And if those systems were compromised or destroyed by a cyber attack, that could be highly escalatory. Um, if you were going to launch a first strike or initiate attack against an adversary, the first thing that you would want to do is compromise as much as possible your adversary's ability to know what's happening in the battle space, right? And so if a state were to have its military systems successfully attacked or compromised, that would be highly escalatory because it would be a precursor of more military action to come. And faced with that circumstance of its military systems potentially being compromised, a state might choose to strike at its adversary before being struck itself. Likewise, um, spoofing of a military intelligence system would be um, making a system believe that it is under attack when it is not. Right? That's something that a third party could do to precipitate conflict between two states. Right? If, if a third party believes that it has an interest in states going to war with one another, it could create uh, through cyber attacks or through um, cyber exploits the belief in one state that it was under attack from another with the idea of prompting retaliation. So those are some of the basic ways in which uh, a cyber attack could cause escalation to kinetic military force. The arguments against escalation. Right? If you're NEG and you're extending defense to the case against a cybersecurity affirmative, some things that you could say. First, attribution is highly challenging. It is very difficult to definitively know who launched a cyber attack against you. And the challenge of attribution introduces time into a military encounter. Escalation is likely under time pressure but the necessity of knowing who attacked you introduces time in which cooler heads can prevail. And independently, if you don't know who attacked you, you don't know who to retaliate against, and states will be hesitant to launch attacks without knowing for sure who attacked them. Second, there's an idea of the defender's advantage. So cyber vulnerabilities can be patched pretty quickly. Once you discover that an adversary has compromised your network, the patch for that is quicker, usually, than further exploits can be. So defenders have an advantage. Successful exploits take a long time. Patches can stop escalation of cyber attacks in the midst. So a cyber attack might begin to succeed, but before it can do things like collapse the entire power grid, it could be detected, and the vulnerability could be patched. States use cyber operations as an explicit alternative to kinetic force. Cyber operations, according to many, are a way for great powers to compete with one another without having to uh, actually use military force against one another. This is related to an idea um, with nuclear deterrence that's called the stability-instability paradox, which is the idea that if two countries have nuclear weapons, it can paradoxically make small-scale conflicts between them more likely because both believe that a small-scale conflict will not escalate to the use of nuclear weapons, right, because that would have disastrous consequences for both, and so both feel emboldened to undertake small-scale conflicts as a result of that. This is kind of a similar idea, that states see cyber attacks as an acceptable way to compete with one another precisely because they know that escalation to actual kinetic military force is unlikely, and therefore they can use cyber attacks to prosecute their aims against one another without fear of too much retribution. And that is because, you could say, deterrence holds for high-impact, high-scale critical infrastructure or nuclear command and control attacks, right? That if deterrence works in general, it also works for cyber conflict. The idea that a state would try to completely collapse the United States power grid is unlikely to happen precisely because of the, the same reasons why they would not 
launch a missile against a power plant because they know that it would lead to reprisal and the reprisal would be worse than the gains from undertaking that operation. Quick survey of negative ground in the cybersecurity area and then I want to leave some time for questions. The first is preparing for affirmatives that change the relative offense defense orientation of our cyber strategy, like the AF in our evidence set. The easiest way, I think, to prepare basically against that type of affirmative is impact turn it with the other direction in terms of offense defense. If an affirmative makes our cyber strategy more offensive, OCOs are bad. Cyber strategy should be defensive. If an affirmative makes our cyber strategy more defensively oriented, OCOs are good. This might require uniqueness counter plans. One of the things that our existing cyber AF can say is that disadvantages to OCOs are not unique because the US will inevitably adopt an offensive cyber posture. The only kind of relevant question is whether we coordinate and cooperate with NATO to make those operations effective, right? The classic, it's inevitable, we make it effective argument. Um, I think it's pretty reasonable in this case because our strategy is offensive now. So you might need to counter plan to adopt a uh, less offensive posture, but you know you should be careful not to make that too permutable by, like, the way I would write this counter plan is something like increase security cooperation with NATO in the area of de-escalatory cyber operations, something like that, or whatever verbiage you think best describes the non-offensive strategy that you um, want to initiate. For AFs that secure particular systems, I think that these affirmatives are much less likely to have a robust warrant for security cooperation key, DOD key, NATO key, et cetera, right? The affirmatives that are harder to impact turn are, I think, more vulnerable to the agent generics that are built into the topic by security cooperation, security assistance. Affirmatives that expand the applicability of Article 5, you know, those affirmatives are kind of the offensive hardline type of strategy. Those might link to disads about, you know, adversary backlash or lash out, international law, because those affirmatives might expand the conditions under which we resort to force, which might be problematic from an IHL perspective, as uh, discussed earlier. And AFs that would contract or narrow Article 5 linked to deterrence arguments, which is essentially another way of saying impact turning the AFs that change the offense-defense orientation with the other. So um, in the slides for this, I have a couple of cards that are illustrative of this basic premise. I think this is uh, a pretty good card from one of the original articles criticizing the persistent engagement strategy that says that um, OCOs are escalatory and potentially would compromise internet openness. So that's an impact direction that you could take. You don't need to, like, I'll send the slides out. You don't need to write anything down about this card. You don't need to grab the site, et cetera. Um, and then here's an example of what I was talking about with regard to um, the specific system affirmatives being more vulnerable to agent counterplans. It's a very, it's a pretty decent Department of State security assistance uh, versus cooperation counterplan card for the cables affirmative. Just illustrative of the type of evidence that you might want to uh, make these strategies work. Okay, that's the presentation. I would be happy to take some questions for the next like seven ish minutes. Anybody got questions? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the question was third-party disinformation 
how does it affect the relationship between NATO allies? And then there was a part uh, about the or of the question about how does that relate to the CDMA? Um, the last part, I'm not sure that it really does. I think the, the CDMA, the Cooperative or the Cyber Defense Management Authority, um, deals almost exclusively with exploits and uh, attacks into NATO's actual networks. It's not really as much about the information ecosystem. The first part of the question uh, was how does disinformation complicate relationships between NATO allies? Um, I don't think we've seen really explicitly disinformation campaigns designed to create division between the allies as such, although that's something that you know, that, that Russia might be very likely to do if the alliance were to adopt a more explicitly pro-Ukraine posture, or you know, we might be seeing the beginnings of Russian disinformation campaigns with regard to the possible accession of Sweden and Finland. Right? That might be uh, an, an issue where a disinformation campaign could target uh, division between the allies. So anytime there's a kind of salient issue that might uh, create division between the allies, it could be ripe for a disinformation campaign. Mm -hmm. Are there any other other actors that could use that? Yeah, so uh, the question was the likely actor that I, um, that I mentioned, the Institute for Security Governance, by no means is that the only actor that uh, would be likely to implement cybersecurity affirmatives. I mentioned them mostly because I thought that it was hilarious how definitive they were that they will respond to your email. Um, but, you know, it is uh, a likely actor um, to do something like training, education, et cetera. If that's part of the affirmative, that's a likely actor, um, but certainly by no means is it the only one. Daniel? The question was, if you email them and they respond, can you use it as a card? Yeah, I think you can. A lot of, uh, a lot of us college folks in here have emailed authors and put it on blogs and used it as cards in our day. Uh, you just have to publish it somewhere where other people can see it. So the easy way to do that is to like make a blog spot and publish it. And as a best practice, you should publish it sometime before, five minutes before the debate starts, when you want to read it. You should make it possible for other people to access it. But yeah, and I also generally um, do ask for uh, the author's um, consent to cite them in a, in a debate. Actually, this Healy card, this article contains a very significant typo. Very significant typo. This article has a line that says, norms are the most effective when they are not perceived as mutually binding. And I was like, what? what? This makes no sense in the context that it's being written in. So um, this card is from an AF from the college space topic that we never got to read because the NDT got canceled because of COVID. And so when I was writing that AF before that tournament, I emailed Healy and said, hey, I'm, I'm reading your article. It seems like this not is a total mistake. Can you clarify that for me? And he was like, oh yeah, I have no idea what I was doing there. Your reading seems reasonable. So we had a card prepared because we modified the, the text of that card to take out the not. And then we had the email right below it that said, yeah, this was a typo because our whole argument was that norms need to be mutual in order to be effective to beat the Unilat counter plan. That line was very important to us. So yeah, you can uh, read cards from uh, authors that you email as long as you post them publicly and get their agreement. Other questions? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think it's fairly unlikely that a cyber attack could actually launch nuclear weapons. Um, what's more of a risk, I think, is an attack that compromises the intelligence systems that feed into our nuclear command structure that would make us you know, either a unable to communicate with our forces or make us believe that we were under attack when we weren't. But I think it's highly, highly, highly unlikely that a cyber attack could cause the launch of nuclear weapons. Yeah, in the back. Would a VPN solve attacks? Is that the question? Um, no, I, I wasn't saying that derisively. I was making sure I was hearing. <laughs> 
so yeah, the, the question was like, what about an app that implemented VPNs for NATO? Uh, I mean, I think that that could be an approach, but I'm not sure why security cooperation would be important to that, right? A lot of affirmatives that try to just get NATO to implement some particular practice can probably be done by the Department of State diplomatically and probably do not require security cooperation. Uh, yeah, go over there. Yeah, so the question was, what is the affirmative ground in terms of cybersecurity against non-state actors? So I think that any argument for why security cooperation in cybersecurity is a good mechanism could be applied to cybersecurity against non-state actors. The issue, though, is that non-state actor capabilities are so much less than state actors that just the impacts are, are smaller, right? Um, as Professor Ali talked about yesterday, um, non-state cyber criminals typically tend to, you know, corporate espionage or corporate theft, ransomware, et cetera, which is more of an annoyance than something that, you know, we kind of traditionally impact with big debate impacts. Would all NATO nations have to agree on a change in policy? Generally, yes. NATO tries to make uh, decisions by consensus as much as possible. So there might be room, and I've seen some evidence that suggests that uh, within NATO there could be kind of like bilateral projects that then develop ideas and, and best practices for the alliance as a whole. So it might depend on the affirmative, but in general, most uh, NATO decisions do require consensus. I want to take one more question and then go to a break. So yeah, go ahead. And you, yeah. Yes, you had your hand up? Uh, I guess for Black Ops, the most useful for me is obviously the article from our Global Counter Cyber Attack, but whether or not a cyber attack is an armed attack is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. So would that like be decided by the NSC? And then have there been instances where these criteria have been like established at all? Good question. So that question was, um, would the determination of a cyber attack triggering Article 5 be done by the NAC? And have there been instances where those criteria were met or articulated? So the first part, yes. The NAC would be the body that would determine whether to invoke Article 5 in response to a cyber attack. And the second part of the question, no. There has not been a cyber attack that really has come particularly close other than the Estonia attacks to meeting criteria for an armed attack by NATO. And NATO has also not established any criteria for what they would view as an armed attack, cyber attack for reasons of uh, deterrence ambiguity. Okay, thank you all for your attention. Take an eight minute break. Eight minute break back at 1120, please.